Welcome to the Global Missions Podcast, a show for Christ followers who want to participate more effectively in God's work, both at home and to the ends of the earth. Visit us at globalmissionspodcast.com to find show notes, resources, and previous episodes. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. This podcast is brought to you by the Global Missions Toolbox, a new online collection of practical, trusted resources made for those who support global missions from home. Visit us online at globalmissionstoolbox.com to register for access to this growing collection of tools for senders. And now, here's your host, Rob Magwood, better known to many friends as Mags. Well, hello again, everyone. I am here today with our co-host, Maddie DeSmit. Hi, Maddie. Hello. It's good to be here again. Well, I was pretty excited to learn that while I was away last week that you did an episode with Jeannie Marie and the interview and everything. So way to go. Yes, that was great. I was away at a conference, which was amazing. I want to say this was the annual Missio Nexus conference, which is both for agency leaders and for mission leaders from churches. And it was held in Florida. And I got to visit with a number of our former guests, like Tracy Mink, Pastor Tracy from Red Deer. And Ted Essler, of course, was there as the president of Missio Nexus. Marv Newell, Matthew Ellison, Denny Spitters. It was great to uh, connect with some of these friends again. And Maddie, I also got to speak with a couple of our upcoming guests. So Steve Richardson from Pioneers just published a new book. I've got it in my hand. It's called, Is the Mission Still Great? Eight Myths About Missions and What They Mean for the Church. We're going to talk to Steve in just a few weeks about that book. And Dick Brogdon, who is the leader of the Live Dead Movement. And he lives in the Middle East. And in a few weeks later on in the fall, we'll be talking with him. So it was uh, mm -hmm. it was incredible. Wow. Well, very exciting to hear and some good interviews to look forward to over this season. Now, for this conference, was there a theme for the conference? Can you tell us a little about that? There was. The theme of this conference was entitled Counting the Cost. We were really thinking about persecution about danger and about risk in sending faithful workers out to be message bearers. And for me as a leader, it was a very uh, serious and sobering topic. We had a lot of really important conversations about how we need to balance courage, faith-filled courage, in order to engage the unreached. And we have these values, especially in North America, and it's wise, right? We need to be careful and wise and prudent to help try and keep God's servants well safe families and so on. So it was a wonderful time to pray over some of these things and to trust that the Lord really will give us clarity and courage so that we can do his mission well in these days. Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds like a great conference. I'm glad you could be there. Today, we get to hear about the important topic of Sabbath rest. We'll be discussing the gift and challenge of Sabbath rest for missionaries and how those who serve as senders may be able to help missionaries truly rest even while serving cross-culturally. But before we get to this conversation, we'd like to tell you about our sponsor for this episode. Megs, this is a pretty close connection for you and I, right? <laughs> so can you tell us a bit about our sponsor today? This is a sponsor I can speak about with some familiarity because it is our organization that we serve with, Send International. And of course, Maddie and I serve in the Canadian office in London, Ontario, but Send has offices around the world. And we say that we have 18 different passports serving in our members around the world sent out to about 65 different people groups. The mission of our organization is to help mobilize God's people for faithful service to engage the unreached in order to establish reproducing churches. So that's what we seek to do. Some of our current focus or priorities, let's say, are diaspora ministries because people are moving around the world in new ways, co-vocational ministries, inviting people who may not have a seminary degree or Bible school necessarily, but have other professions and talents and expertise, helping them get into missions, and then internships for students and young professionals as well. So if any of those things sound like they might be of interest to you or someone in your church, we invite you to stop by our website, send, S-E-N-D, dot org. Well, we are grateful to Send International for their support to bring you this episode. 
And now the last thing before we get to the interview today, if you're signed up for our newsletter, you will already know that the Global Missions Toolbox online community launched today. And we hope that this will facilitate lots of conversation about missions and how we can serve as senders. And some of these conversations can actually be in a live context. And our first live online event will actually be a follow-up Q&A on this episode with Lizette Gabre on the topic of Sabbath rest. So we encourage you to sign up for the online community today so that you can have a chance to get your questions in and get all the details about this upcoming event. So you can find the link to join in the show notes of this episode, and I encourage you to check that out. Mm -hmm. Now, let's jump into today's conversation. Our guest today is Lisette Gabre, who is originally from Sweden, but who has lived in Asia since 1995, first in China and later in Thailand, where she lives now with her husband, Christian. Lizette serves with Operation Mobilization. Yay, OM. Yay, OM. Yes, yeah, we're big fans here, Lizette. I know. (laughs) She is a TCK consultant, and I'll just pause to say TCK, third culture kid. Yes. Sometimes we call them MKs if they're missionary families, but that's what TCK. She serves as a consultant there and a people care facilitator and provider. Lizette is a speaker and a writer, and she's often facilitating online trainings and webinars now. This will be our second conversation with Lizette on this podcast. Be sure to check out the previous episode, which was 164, entitled Building a Healthy Marriage on the Mission Field. It has lots of practical ideas for married couples and for those who love and want to support married couples as they serve on the mission field. Lizette, welcome back to the Global Missions Podcast. Thank you so much. I am so excited to be back here again. It was just so pleasant last time. So yeah, I've been looking forward to it. Thank you for inviting me back. Well, we are looking forward to it. Just before we uh, started recording, Lizette and I were visiting just a little bit with Maddie and Steve, and we noted that today's topic is a really important one. And sometimes God's servants are not really good at this, the idea of Sabbath. And so, Lizette, we're looking forward to learning with you. We hope this will be helpful not only to mission workers who may be listening to this, but to the supporting constituency, people who know and love missionaries in their home churches, pastors, missions committees. So here we go, learning and listening together. How did this become an important topic from your point of view, why are you passionate about this? I mean, I think there's two reasons. One is that I have kept meeting people that were burnt out, people that was no longer functioning. They, were, they ended up being dysfunctional. They didn't function in the families. They actually didn't function in the team. It was not even very pleasant to work with them. Secondly, I realized that I worked a lot and I needed to practice Sabbath. Both my husband, Christian and I, we have really high capacity, both of us. And I will talk more about capacity later, but we have very high capacity. So we work a lot. Both of us, we were in in leadership for two different organizations and we raised three kids and we learned languages and, and all of that. And we did that well. We were thriving and did it well. But I also realized that that actually kind of became like a drug for me. Like it became my God. So in the end, like, who am I serving? Why am I doing what I'm doing? And when I realized that, whoa, maybe I'm actually, I'm a little bit of a workaholic. (laughs) I decided that I need to do something about that. So I would say right now that I'm a recovering workaholic. I still do a lot. I still uh, have a big capacity. I do a lot, but I do have a balanced life. And I think that's when I got passionate about it because I could see that it was life changing for me. When I added in some boundaries, I added in rest, very intentional rest into my life. It was actually life changing. Well, I appreciate this is coming from some of your personal journey then as well. And some of your experience, we look forward to learning from that. I just see here in the West and a lot of our audience is in the global West. I think we don't necessarily do a good job of Sabbath period. We press on, we're big on productivity and, and it's not necessarily a badge to say that we're busy, but if somebody isn't busy, we think, well, maybe something isn't right. And so 
I like your expression of a balanced life. If we think especially about missionaries, mission workers, God's servants, why do you suggest that Sabbath rest can be so difficult for missionaries? I mean, I think there are several reasons, but I think that one reason and maybe the biggest reason is that mission is a calling. What I am doing is actually a calling. It's a calling and a calling never stops, right? A calling is 24 seven. If I'm supposed to do this, I'm supposed to do it all the time. Also, I think particularly, of course, it depends on what kind of role you have, but particularly if you are serving people, you are actually working with real people that needs your help, they need your support. You are there, you're sent from your home church to go to the nationals or the local people. How can you say no to them? How can you have boundaries? I think that's one, the fact that it is a calling. And when it's a calling, you involve God in the whole thing. It gets spiritual, it gets very difficult to say no to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think another one is the fact that it's a big gray zone where you don't know what is ministry and work. And what is just daily life of being a human being, a being a sister, a brother. For example, when I go to Thai church, is that because I'm a missionary in Thailand? Or is that because I go to church, which I also would have done back home? There's a lot of these things. Or, for example, maybe I meet my neighbor out on the street and I'll talk with them. Is that ministry because I'm here or I think that gray zone makes it very, very difficult. Obviously, some, depending on your role, may have a very clear job description, and it's easier to say. But I do think that the fact that ministry is your whole life, you're not counting hours as you do back home. It's about life. It's about a lifestyle. Then I also think, not so much for me personally, but I regularly meet people telling me, what would my supporters think? It's my support. I live with the good of other people. I live with the goodness, expectations. So they expect for me to present what I've done, present results. What would they feel if they would know that I'm laying on the sofa reading a book or that I'm going in the forest? And what would they feel? I personally am relaxed about that, but I regularly meet people. And I haven't even met someone not long ago saying, oh, I would never post that on Facebook because then they see that I have a break. They see that I went on holiday. I'm the opposite. I post that because I want people to see that I can role model. And we got a five-day holiday in. Isn't that exciting? But yeah, I think when you don't have permission and know that you're allowed to rest, then it's really hard. It's very hard. Very interesting. And I, I think you're right with those expectations that come from supporters. I have also seen, I wonder whether you have too, that sometimes a missionary has projected those expectations onto their supporters and the supporter says, actually, I, I didn't have that expectation and the missionary's done it to themselves, so to speak. It definitely is a two way. And in the beginning, it's like a chicken and the egg. You don't know who, who was right. the first. Yeah. And also, I think that sometimes I tell people, did you actually know that this is a fact? Have you asked your supporters? And really, honestly, sometimes the supporters did not have that expectations. It's just something that we get into our head. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's really good. Well, we'll start from a, an understanding, not an assumption, but an understanding that we should practice the Sabbath. But let's start with the why. Why should missionaries practice Sabbath, Lizette? I mean, for me, it's a non-negotiable. I think you should, because it's actually a command. It's from the Bible. It's a command. And we don't really want to mess with all the other commands. Why are we messing with this one? And, you know, also, if you look into the Bible, there's uh, so many biblical examples. God created the world. And what did he do in day seven? He looked at it and said, wow, this turned out really good. It's beautiful. And then he rested. He actually took some time off and rested. I also think that there are stories of Jesus where, I mean, he slept in the boat. And also he actually left the crowd and went to the other side to rest, to gain energy, to then go back to the people again. And I think if we don't do that, it's really not going to work in the long run. It's like, you can pour from an empty cup, but if there's no coffee in the cup, there's nothing to pour from. And I, I see that in workers the whole time. They want to run and run and run, but in the end, there's nothing to run on. 
you're not doing a good job any longer. You're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. Mm-hmm. That's so, so wise, really. I mean, I think there's the beneficial reasons for rest as well. Uh, not just the biblical side. I think there definitely are just benefits of resting. It's good for your body physically. I think mentally and emotionally. And I also think there's definitely a spiritual aspect as well. If you don't rest, I think that you're kind of giving a foothold in to the devil. I think you're kind of opening up because you're so tired, you can't think straight. You're so tired, so you somehow goes down that slippery slope of what is sin and not sin. And I just think that you're opening up a whole world, but you don't want to open up. It's much better to be healthy emotionally and spiritually and mentally and physically. And I think rest and Sabbath will do that. Mm -hmm. And this is something that uh, I suppose we'll maybe get to the practice of rest a little bit. It's not like something you do once and it holds you over for months at a time, right? This is a rhythm. You talk about the balance of life. We'll get to that, I suppose. (laughs) Maybe I'm, I'm getting ahead, but it of course affects us. But you've also talked a little bit about how it impacts others around us, right? It's our personal well-being, but it impacts others. Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. And like I said in the beginning, I have definitely had people on my team, they would have done much better if they would have rested. And I think we can all see when we face stress or transition, we get on the edge. We are not nice any longer. And I think when you are tired, when you are on the edge of being burned out, when you haven't had your weekly day off or your time to rest, it really affects people around you. I don't think you have the same patience with your spouse, with your children, with your colleagues or the local people, even the, like in the culture and the culture shock, the culture you're living. I think it's just, it will spill over because if you are not on the toes here, I think it's going to spill over in so many ways for the people around you. You can tell the difference. Yeah, that's very wise. Well, let's step forward into this. I know you've got some key thoughts you'd like to share with us about Sabbath rest. Where would you like to begin? Oh, <laughs> I mean, I think the number one thing I want to say that really was something I discovered was that rest is a gift. Yes, it's a command and we need to do it, but it's actually a gift. It's there for me. It's available for me. I can step into rest. I can add rest into my life and make that a natural part. Uh, There's this absolutely wonderful book, but it's in Swedish. You all need to learn Swedish. It's actually by a Swedish author called Thomas Kadeen, and the title is It Happens When You Rest. And he says something that I love in his book. He talks about, yes, you rest from something, but you also rest in someone. It's a matter of resting from what you're doing, but you're resting in God. And I think that is so beautiful. So for me, that yes, that's what rest is. And then, of course, rest looks differently. Like the way I'm sure the way you rest, I mean, the way I rest, the way my husband rests are two different things. But I do think that it's a matter of taking a break, switching off what you're normally doing and doing something else, doing something different. Mm-hmm. You talk about that self-awareness and what works well for you. You know, you can extend that and say, well, if we're going to, you mentioned your husband, Christian, if you rest in different ways, there's going to be an understanding and permission to receive that gift in different ways. And that's going to be different ways, even in a marriage, but in a mission team. Yes. Or the way those supporters may have expectations, the way I rest is not the way my missionary rests. We need to know ourselves and what works well for us, I would submit then. Yes, definitely. And I think that's definitely one of the things when I come into a team, and I'll talk about this in my webinar as well, is about the importance of self-awareness, knowing myself, how much sleep do I, do I actually need? What fills up my love tank, my stress tank? And I think my big, big, big thing, I always talk about plates, the capacity, what kind of capacity do you have? And way, way, way back in the days when we lived in China about 20 years ago or so, we got a visit from one of the executive directors and he was asking, how are things going? And then I started to complain and I said, it goes well, but I'd, I don't understand why some people don't take the responsibility. Why is it up to some of us to do everything and some people do 
so little. And they always say, oh, it's too much on my plate. And I was like, they got nothing on their plate. And he gave me the key to understanding. So he said to me, when God created us, he actually created us in the shape of plates. Just think of yourself of a plate. So he was saying, think of yourself and Christian. Both of you, you have amazing capacity. So think of yourself as the size of a big, big, big pizza plate, like the biggest Italian pizza plate. The pizza is almost overflowing and there's a lot going on. So many different kinds of toppings. Still, you are thriving and you're loving it. Like it's, you can handle it. You can eat the pizza. You're not overwhelmed. That's you. Then you get this other person in your team. And when God created that person, he gave them the size of the small, small little saucer that's under an espresso cup because God created that person in that image. God is happy. God wants that person to be this way. That's the way they want for him or her to be. And God is rejoicing over both of these sides of plates. So for me, that has helped me for about 20 years. When I'm with people, I look at them, I get to know them, and I ask them about their capacity. Because if I know, okay, Meg's plate, he's, wow, he has like a normal dining plate. That's what I can expect of you. I'm not going to add on too much because then you cannot handle it. Likewise, for myself, I know my boundaries. This is the size of my plate, which means when I'm getting too close for it to overflow, I will need to say no to some things. I know how many toppings I can have on my pizza. So for me, knowing your capacity, it's super important because that helps you prioritize. Well, prioritize one thing, saying no. Well, that's part of prioritizing, I guess. I know you'll you'll have some practical uh, advice for us here in a little bit too. So maybe let's go to that. You know what? I did want to go back. I so appreciated that you use the term gift. Mm-hmm. I have met some who might practice Sabbath, but it's more of a reward. They see it as a reward. They have to work hard first so I can get my Sabbath. Mm-hmm. And I just think gift is a better term for that somehow, that it's not a reward for having worked hard. It's it's different. No, it's a gift from God. Mm-hmm. I often, because I'm actually, I kind of have two moods. Either I have one gear when I'm very, very, very active. Or my other one is just, I just lay flat on my sofa and read a book or take a nap. <laughs> but often I can be on the sofa and I can smile because I know as well as God has been smiling with me as we've been running and being busy and doing things, he's smiling with me. He rejoices in the fact that I am resting. If I were to be in Sweden, one way for me to relax would be to go to my favorite lake out in the forest. And sometimes I talk with God, I skip and I jog and I run. Sometimes I'm angry and I shout at God because I'm upset because people are crazy or life is crazy. Life is unfair. But whatever I do, I know that God is with me and he is truly, truly rejoicing with us when we are resting. I am sure that he's truly rejoicing. I have to say that that does not mean that we should be lazy. And I think that's important. I'm not saying that keeping the Sabbath and Taking a rest equals being lazy. I'm not saying that at all. Mm -hmm. That's a good clarification too. So let's be practical about this. What can Sabbath rest look like, healthy Sabbath rest look like for a missionary? I mean, I think establishing a rhythm. I mean, I know I do have friends that are using the Sabbath candle. They really want to make a beginning of an end. We light a candle and then we know the Sabbath has started and then you have that going until the Sabbath is over. I personally don't do that myself, but I need to think through what do I want to do on my Sabbath? And I don't think it needs to be Sunday or Saturday. If that's your busiest day, maybe that's when you really are doing ministry. It's probably not your Sabbath is not a rest day, then you need to look at your schedule and schedule that some other time. But I think you can schedule it, make a rhythm where there is room for you to have a Sabbath. And I would say as well, think through what would I want to do during that day. And for me, it's a matter of doing the things that I normally don't do. Like I have created a little bit of an oasis for myself. I have like my favorite corner where I have my Ikea chair 
where I sit and I have my journal and I stack the books there. I can have my coffee. I will draw to my little coffee and my corner and my chair. Outside, I also have a rose bush here and uh, the bamboo and I got a chair and I sit there. I go to one of my oases and then I sit there. I read. I think it's good once a week if you don't do it daily, but particularly once a week to stop and reflect. What happened during the past week? What were the highs and the lows? What have I been through? Why did I react that way? What has happened? Count my blessings. If I haven't been counting my blessings before, just count my blessings. But it's up to everyone to decide what do you want to do during that time. I also love to drink coffee with my husband and talk or have friends over, whatever that is. I mean, have friends over, go for a walk, go to the gym, whatever it is. But do something that is not necessarily work. Well, we may be on other sides of the earth at the moment, Lizette, but a number of the things like sitting for a visit with friends, having coffee, this really resonates. Also. Yes, yes, I love that. I love that. <laughs> what I hear you saying too is there's an intentionality you've planned for, it, you've prepared for it. It's not accidental. Probably there are going to be moments that are restful and that's wonderful too, but you've prepared for Sabbath, both by knowing yourself and then setting the stage for it, whether it's in one of your oasis or whatever, but it's okay to take a little bit of effort to plan for this. Yeah, please. Yes, I think definitely worth. It's worth adding it into your schedule and knowing yourself, what does it mean? What is restful for you? And plan for it to use the time well. That's good. What other practical ideas would you suggest for uh, missionaries? I mean, I over and over and over again, I say to people, don't do this journey alone. Don't do the journey alone. And that means basically any area of your life. I don't think we are supposed to be surviving and doing the journey by ourselves. I think particularly when we're talking about areas like Sabbath, having accountability is very important. I love the phrase life-giving friend. Got that by a Canadian friend, Hannah. Hi, Hannah. I love the phrase life-giving friend. I do have people in my life that I call my life-giving friends. Other people will probably call them accountability partner. But that's someone that I've given permission to journey with me, to speak truth in my life, to stop and ask or tell me, you've been running a lot lately. You've been doing so much. When did you last have fun? When did you stop? When are you going to take a day off? And you realize, oh, that's a good point. Yes. Or, for example, someone I share with both of these people, I share, well, I got an, I was asked if I wanted to do this. I'm very tempted to say yes, but what do you think? Because then she would challenge me and ask me, sounds great. I know you would love it, but why are you doing it? Just to check out my motives. Why are you doing what you are doing? Both of these people are definitely people that would ask me, about my rest. What did you do to rest? Was it restful? And I ask that of other people as well. When people have been on a holiday, it goes like, oh, I had a we had a holiday for a week. What was it like? Was it restful? Because it sounds so good. We went for a holiday, but some people are dead when they get back from their holidays. And then probably it wasn't a restful holiday. So yeah, but I would say don't do it alone. I think we think that we can do things alone, but we actually can't. You need to have some accountability in there, particularly if you're like myself, a recovering workaholic, because there's so many fun things to do in life, you know? Well, it's uh, very helpful. Who will be the life-giving friend that will just help us stay sharp? Do we have a Sabbath rhythm established? It brings me back to the idea of expectations of others, too, and maybe communicating well. Maybe that reflects how I think about things, right? What do others see from the outside? But explaining to colleagues or to others, supporters, maybe why we're doing this, that it's intentional, it's on purpose. Yeah, definitely. And I also think when you know your own capacity and you know your own boundaries and you know what brings you rest, then you can communicate that to other people. You can also communicate then, you know what, I'm not going to do that or I can only do this much. I know myself by now and I can't do more or I need to prioritize and this is one of the things I will have to say no to or this is something else I would like to do. 
Well, here's the topic of boundaries then, and the idea of drawing lines reasonably around, not laziness, we're not advocating that at all, but having a healthy rhythm. Many of us find it difficult to say no. Some of us find it difficult to say no to good ideas, good ministry opportunities. It goes on and on. The needs of the world are big and deep and broad. What advice do you have for missionaries about saying no? I mean, I think that these two letters, N-O, are just one of the hardest things to do. I think it's very difficult to say no, particularly because we're back to what we said before. It's a calling. You're serving God and do whatever you do, you know, for, you know, and this you're supposed to work hard, right? You're supposed to do whatever you're doing wholeheartedly. So the thought of, hmm, how do you say no? And I do think I'm still working on this, that sometimes saying no without saying, I don't have to, to tell you why I say no. I think that I am, for one, need to do it all the time. Someone asked me the other day, can you eat coffee? And actually, no, I could not. I could not see this person. But then I was like, oh, maybe if I move my schedule, oh, well, the reason I can't. And then I'm st- getting myself into trying to explain. And in the end, like, okay, why am I explaining why I can't see this person? It probably would have been kinder to just like, honestly, I have no time today, but I will see you tomorrow or whenever it is. I would recommend that you try to practice to say no, knowing that you don't always have to explain. But the problem and the challenge is when it's real people. I think a task, it's easier to say no to. This is a task. I can say no to a task. If someone asks you, would you be up for doing Sunday school this term? Then I could think about it. It's Sunday school. No, I could say no to that. Or whatever it could be, whatever ministry or whatever task. But when it actually comes to there are people in your life, could be your teammates, not to mention nationals or local people knocking on your door. How do you say no to them? And also remember that particularly if you live, like we live in Asia, it's very relational. They have no aspect of Sabbath. I mean, I was actually telling Steve yesterday when we talked that I was in a, in a session with a Chinese pastor teaching about Sabbath. Then we were up in breakout groups. I knew I shouldn't have asked him, but I couldn't help myself. So I asked him, what does Sabbath look like in your life? And he was very Buhayisa. He was very embarrassed. But then he said, well, uh, you know, I actually don't have time for Sabbath. And I knew that he would say that because it's not in the concept of people here. Rest means something else. Rest here could be when you're together with your friends, when you eat together. The whole thought of going away by yourself, it's not an Asian concept at all. That's a very Western concept. So some people, they never get rest. I have pastors in the neighboring countries here. That is one of the things they say, I never got to be alone. They're constantly people coming to my house. So at the same time there, I think that we got a role to actually role model for people that it is okay to be alone. It's okay to withdraw. Jesus did that as well. I think it's okay. But again, there needs to be a fine line of knowing when you should not say no. I don't think we should just say no by principle to people. I think if there are people, we need to know when to say no and when to say yes. And sometimes I can feel so clearly that I hear God's voice say, you know what, you got to be with her now. Welcome them in. Let them come. So it's very hard to explain, but I think we need to be tuned in with the Holy Spirit to listen to when we should say no and we should actually give up our own little rest as well. Not all the time, though. Not all the time. Right. Yeah. Well, that's the discernment, right? That's understanding what's best, what's wise. I did come across uh, an article by an author. We'll put it in the show notes to uh, Michael Hyatt, who has some suggestions for those who are in really busy schedules faced with good opportunities, Mm. how to graciously say no. And if you need to do that through writing or it's in a conversation, he's got a few hooks to be very gracious, but very clear and very firm. Don't leave the door sort of half open if you're saying no and things like that. We'll include that in the show notes. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I would agree that because if you leave the door half open, then it's not clear. It's, It's still no boundaries. So yeah. That's it. 
Well, after we take a short break, we'll have Lizette describe a few distinctions in the way that different generations in the church may view Sabbath rest, and also some practical ideas for sending churches who want to support missionaries in finding that and maintaining that healthy rhythm. Before we get to that part of our conversation, we'd like to share with you this mission resource that we hope will be helpful to you and your church. We'd like to share with you two new Global Missions Toolbox blog posts, one contributed by an author of All Nations International and one from a missionary at Send International. In these posts, you will learn about the four-part gift that Sabbath rest is, some warning signs of burnout, and some tested practices for applying Sabbath rest to life as a missionary. We hope these will be helpful to build on the conversation that we are having today. You can get access to these informative, encouraging posts at globalmissionstoolbox.com or in the show notes of this episode. We are back with Lizette Gabre, and we're exploring how missionaries can practice healthy Sabbath rest. Lizette, we know that there are differences between the generations, and these are generalities we understand about age groups and so forth. But I wonder, what are some of the factors you think we should be aware of when it comes to looking at Sabbath? Yeah, I think definitely being aware and acknowledge the fact that there are generational differences. And I also think in that sentence, though, that there are ditches, there are the extremes. Sometimes we look back, we'll, we read biographies of the old missionaries, like they brought their coffee to the field, they were going to die and they work day and night. They had no member care, so ever. They had no rest. And sometimes we look at them like, whoa, they were heroes. But actually, if you're really honest, there were a lot of things that they could have changed for the better. And then I do think, I mean, I did placement for one of the organizations where I worked for about seven, eight years. And I started seeing a big difference. I think even if we go back 25, 30 years In the generation that I am, when we went to the field, we prepared for years. We were willing to just work very, very hard. But if you look at the people even older than me, like my parents' generations, born in the 40s, that's a generation that just work, 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 work. They are the hardworking generation. As I did placement, I could clearly see even during the placement phase where the younger ones were really having boundaries. I'm coming and I'm coming to do this. And I need to have a job description. How many hours do I need to be in the office? Is there a minimum? How much, what do you expect of me? It's very different. I think for myself, when we went to the field in 1995, we were just wholeheartedly, this is what we're going to do. Whatever many days and hours, you know, it was nothing about counting hours. I could see though in the new people coming out, that is much more about counting hours, being very strict on not doing too much extra. And I will also say that it's kind of like going between two ditches. But I also think that's the whole lifestyle. Like I see that even in my own children who are the end 20, early 30s. There's just that generation when you have more boundaries and it's just different. And there's also in the mission field. I will say people here as well, when you get the younger generation, I think it's just a matter of being aware and having a clear communication of what is expected. And then also encourage proper rest in all of that. And like I said, it's not about being lazy. And I also think that when we talk about rest, Sabbath or self-care, it's not about being selfish. It's not about putting me first. It's about putting me there as well. Sometimes we only focus on the other people. So I think just being aware that the the younger generation that are entering the field now, they're not coming for life. They're coming for a couple of years and many of them, not everyone, but many. And they're coming definitely with kind of a clear mindset of this is how much you will get out of me. This is how much I will give. Now, that's very helpful. I think probably for missionaries, for churches, also for agencies, And this is a generalization as well, but often, not always, but sometimes the leaders are of an earlier generation, understandably, they've been on the field longer, and their expectations of these new people coming with a different perspective, it's going to be helpful to be really clear between those, this is not laziness, this is boundaries. And respectfully, 
you more senior leader or older generation, you may not have had those boundaries and it might have been better. Just good communication is going to be at the core of great teamwork on this. Communication and expectations, clear expectations. Yeah, 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 yeah. definitely. Yeah. As we keep it in mind, you know, just principles for that clear communication, clear expectations, anything else that you would add with regard to those generational differences? Yeah, I think, again, remembering that boundaries may look different. It may not be better. It may not be worse. It's just that your boundaries and my boundaries are maybe very different. And that I think the, the boundaries would look different depending on generations as well. Mm-hmm. Well, before we finish, Lizette, many of our audience serve faithfully in local churches. They may be on missions committees, serving as a pastor, or just loving and caring for missionaries. We want to also speak to them. How can we as senders help our missionaries practice healthy Sabbath rest? I think the most important you can do if you are in a home church, mission committee, or a supporter, the number one thing you can do is to give permission to rest. Just even tell them, you have my permission to rest. We are expecting you to rest. Because when you give that permission to rest, it actually is something you can take and receive as a worker. As a worker on the field, you go like, actually, I remember that they told me that they give me permission to rest. Yeah, and I think for practical reasons, I would say that if you, for example, uh, depending on which country you are, but if the worker, the missionary is coming back home and maybe you do have a summer cottage, maybe you have a house, ask well, I saw that you're coming back home. Would you want to borrow our summer cottage for a week up in the forest? Because that would be an amazing treat. Or we've been borrowing someone's house, which is just like an enormous treat to be able to be, you know, in a nice family house with a big garden by the lake and just offer that. And I remember when we lived in China, even to get gifts and then go away and spend a nice a night in a nice hotel. Our kids will still talk about that, how amazing that was. We got away because where we lived, it's back in the days, it wasn't very modernized. It wasn't very fancy. So to go away and spend a night in a nice hotel was a treat. So that's something you can do if you serve at home send a gift and say, this money is not for ministry. It's not for your org or agency or church. We want you to use this money for your family or for yourself if you're single. Go away, go on a holiday. And then I would also say, encourage them to just ask, what do you need to rest? And what about ABC child in your family? What about your husband? And what can you do as a couple And ask and then see if they would say, well, we're really tired and we can't rest at home. Ask, how much would it cost for you to go and spend the night in a hotel? If you were to go away out from your place, how much would you need? And could we get that money for you? And then maybe ask just for a special love gift to bring that. And even I would say just ask questions because I always say that, Asking is caring. If when you ask questions, you reach out, you reach out with a hand and saying, how are you doing? I read your newsletter and I felt a bit concerned. Are you stressed? Do you rest enough? Do you get enough quality time in with your husband, your spouse, with friends, with your kids, whatever it could be? And then ask, what are your needs? And be really open and honest, because I think that's one way of showing care. And if they say, well, you know, for us, there would be to be baking, but we don't have the ingredients. Well, could I send you the ingredients? So could you, can I send you money to buy the ingredients? Or do you need a good book? Maybe you need a good podcast to listen, whatever it can be. I would say, ask, do you know yourself? Do you know what you need? And just have that caring relationship, I think would be very appreciated. Oh, so many helpful, practical ideas there. And we know that many of our listeners do want to really love and support our mission workers. Undergirding all of this is an awareness of and a relationship with your missionaries as well. So please do reach out and get to know your missionary families sent out from your church. As you do, then you can listen and ask maybe some of these questions uh, that will be healthy for them as well. Lizette, this has been so rich. I'd like to talk with you a little bit about resources that you would recommend to our audience. First, I'd like to ask about your webinar that you offer yourself, and then I'll ask you about other resources. What's the title of your webinar and what is the content of that? 
My title of the webinar is Thriving, Not Just Surviving, because I met so many missionaries that are barely surviving. You can barely see their nose because they're just under the water. They're about to sink. And in the webinar, I talk about self-awareness. I talk about the love tank and the stress tank. And I talk about rest. I talk about knowing yourself and your capacity and building rhythm into your life. I'm very willing to set up a webinar specifically for a special group, if there would be a, a mission group, an agency or a church that wanted to hear the webinar, then I could do it specifically and target it to that audience. Well, thank you. A great introduction to that. And we will include notes in the show notes as to how you can learn more about Lizette's uh, ministry in that particular webinar. And I know that you are a reader. You've mentioned books. What other resources would you recommend on this topic to our audience, Lizette? I still wish you can read Swedish because that's a very good book. <laughs> yeah, that's too bad. I do have a couple of books and I also have a couple of articles that I would send in the show notes. Yeah, just the importance of creating a rhythm and finding rest, knowing what you're resting from. So yeah, articles and podcasts. And I'll just mention quickly too, we'll get Maddie to include in the show notes some of the other episodes already recorded on this podcast that are related to this topic. We've spoken with Mark Buchanan, for example, and Mike Bowden from Teen in the United States all along the topics of uh, how we take good care of ourselves in a Sabbath rhythm. So it'll be consistent with what you've heard today. Lizette, if anyone would like to follow up with you, if they've got questions in particular, how could they reach you? They could email me at lisette at psmail.net. You can find me there. Very good. We'll have that also. The last question I ask very often, Lizette, of our guests, and I'll uh, finish with this today. If you have the opportunity to speak to a group of people serving on the missions committee, Maybe the pastor is there. These people love their missionaries. They want to do a good job of caring for them and supporting them. What would you like to say to that group? I would say that you need to remember that what you send, who you send, are ordinary people. They are heroes, but they are not heroes. They are ordinary people. They are ordinary human beings with feelings just as yourself, with limitations just as yourself. And then I would say invest in them, invest in them in time, get to know them, care for them, but don't put them on a pedestal because that happens all the time. And it's very, very difficult to be put on a pedestal because we are just people serving the Lord in a different country. What great advice. Lizette, thank you so much again for spending time with us today and sharing with our audience some of what the Lord has taught you and the learning that you've done. May the Lord bless you, encourage your heart. It's been a privilege to have you today again on the Global Missions Podcast. Thank you so much, Max. It's been such a joy and honor. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. What a great conversation. I hope you come away from this episode with a renewed concept of the gift of rest, especially for those who serve in missions. We'd like to say thank you again to our sponsor for this episode, Send International. You can visit them at send.org. Right. Visit them or visit us, you could say. Visit right? us. Send up. <laughs> this podcast is, of course, part of the Global Missions Toolbox. We hope you'll stop by our website to check out this online collection of resources, especially for senders, pastors, missions committees, and family and friends of workers sent to serve in missions. We invite you to join us again in two weeks when we'll continue to explore this grand adventure of being Christ's witnesses to the ends of the earth. 